Hi guys, how you doing? Thanks for joining me today for another true crime episode. So today's story is going to be about a drifter named Gary Michael Hilton. So he went on a killing spree in a few of America's national parks around between 2007 and 2008. So we're going to dive into that. So this story starts in Vocal Park in Georgia down south and apparently this park is huge stretches 230,000 acres there's actually a peak um, somewhere in the forest because it is situated in the forest and if you look up it, apparently you see the peak and it's called Blood Mountain and that is the highest point of the entire area on January the 1st 2008 28 year old Meredith Emerson started off on a hike with her black labrador dog Ella. So they planned to go hiking to Blood Mountain on one of the popular hiking trails. So Meredith knew the area, she was from South Carolina, she'd been to the University of Charleston, so she was no stranger to the, the woods and where she was going and she absolutely loved walking. So after she graduated from university, she started to train her dog to be a physical therapy um, dog. So Meredith, as I said, had hiked the area numerous times and her friends were not worried about her going by herself. So Meredith would always check in with her family and friends after a few hours of hiking. Um, but this time was different because she apparently didn't go back to her car and her friends had not heard from her in quite a few hours and they were starting to get worried about her so they was that worried that they actually called the police so um you know authorities they get these kind of calls all the time um but with this one they kind of realized that they could have an abduction on their hands so um some hikers who had been walking along the same trail they found some strange items they found a police baton some dog treats a dog leash as well and they um said it was found around some area that had been disturbed kind of probably dug up so one of the hikers was actually a former um law and former police officer and he took note of what he was seeing you know because he was used to that kind of thing it used to be his job and one detail he noticed was that um, um they noticed a couple uh, uh, a man and a woman and they were walking backwards basically they were walking um past them as they walked by so basically the former law officer he they and his friends they'd not discovered the, dis the disturbed um uh with the items yet so basically the couple had walked past that what passed before they got there if you understand what i'm saying so the police officers found the car but unfortunately meredith and her dog were nowhere to be seen so they secured the car for evidence and then law and um, police officers from all over the place far and wide um came down to join in on the search for her but apparently the weather was so bad that it was kind of proven impossible to do an actual forest search um, and you know they were just desperate to find her so they put um they put a call out nationwide if anyone had any information to you know get back to them so someone actually did get in contact um a businessman from atlanta called um george tabor and he got in contact around january the first so the description of um the guy who they might be looking for, John Tabor actually rec heard, recognised the description. A white male, hiking in the woods, um, white van, um, golden Labrador. So John, you know, recognised, told police, you know, I think I might know who this is. I think I used to employ this guy. So John told the cops that he hired this guy and he was doing odd jobs for him, small jobs for him here and there. And then just one day he just turned aggressive you know, like his personality just did a whole 180. He, his personality changed completely. He was aggressive. He was delusional. Uh, and John just had to sack him. The guy's name was um, 
Gary Hilton, right? Um, apparently he started to turn, started to make threats to John, um, saying he wants ten thousand dollars, and then he was threatening, saying he's gonna harm his family. So then Gary started sending also threatening letters and stuff, and um, you know obviously John was getting worried. Um, he was threatening him with the law. Um, and it got so bad that John would actually circle his area after he'd finished work just to make sure that he wasn't around. John also sent his family away somewhere from the area and he was sleeping with a gun by his bed. That's how bad this got. So, around the time of the murders, John gets a call from Gary and Gary starts apologising, saying that he's sorry for what he's done. Can he have his job back? and um, that he was living around Blood, Blood Mountain um, near the forest. So John started to play along with this. So John kept him on the phone, um, even promised him the money that he was asking for, um, and saying to him, yeah, you know, you need to come to Atlanta to collect it. By the time Gary turned up, the police were there, and obviously, you know, Gary had gone. Police were not happy that they'd missed him, so, they got Gary's photo and they put it nationwide, um, pleading with anyone with any information to come forward. Okay, so police finally get the hope that they need that Meredith is still alive. And they get it from a long haul truck driver who gets stuck um, by some stream. And he's stuck and he notices an old man and a young woman. And um, as he gets out the van to go towards the old man, so asking for help. Um, the old man jumps up and he suddenly he's like trying to stop the truck driver from going anywhere near the young woman and um, then he realises that he's not going to help him so the truck driver gets on his phone to call for help for someone to come and help him with his truck the old man sees him on his phone and then he kind of packs up him and the young woman and they just go somewhere away so there was hope that Meredith was still alive, um, but soon they, you know, they did some information comes through that suddenly changes this whole script. That same night though, um, when everyone is on high alert, um, looking for Meredith, um, they get a call from some other police officers who say they found some suspicious items, items in a dumpster um, outside a shopping mall. So in the dumpster, um, they found um, men's clothes, men's boots with blood on them and Meredith's wallet. They also said that they'd found uh, Meredith's dog, Ella. Apparently the dog was just walking around um, near a grocery store, um, just looking lost. So thanks to, um, you know, her picture being pushed out and people taking note and wanting to help, um, they finally re receive a 911 call. Okay, I'm 911. What's the exact location? I, I have this, uh, the person of interest in the missing woman case is at this uh, Chevron gas station on Ashford Dunley. Chevron gas station at Ashford Dunley? Yeah. He said the man is there. The van is here. The dog is here. The red dog. And I saw the man's face. And I've been watching the news. And I know it's him. I know it's him. He's got a green. Thanks to that 911 caller, um, the police, um, they, they got him um, and they found him kind of cleaning the car out, trying to get rid of all the evidence, vacuuming the car and that kind of stuff. So they basically caught him red handed trying to get rid of all the evidence. So, you know, they had him um, down the station. They was questioning him for five hours. 
and eventually he agreed to show them where Meredith's body was but he wanted a plea deal he didn't want the death penalty I think he wanted life in prison so they find her body and it's covered in leaves and that kind of um, forest stuff and um but they just find the body there's no head attached search for hours looking for this head and they realize that it's not there um gary's taken it somewhere else so now that they had two crime scenes on their hands and eventually you know after questioning gary again um he finally took them to where her head was so gary um eventually told the police that he bumped into meredith well um, they were both walking their dogs and they got talking um, about the dogs. So they parted ways and uh, Meredith carried on up the mountain and he decided to wait till she returned and then he figured out he was gonna overpower her and intimidate her. Um, so Gary, Gary had the police put on on the knife, what was found at the beginning. And you know, he, uh, he they got into a fight she was using her martial arts skills on him and he, apparently he was saying he was like in his mind thinking giving her praise for the martial arts he was telling the police and at one point she was overpowering him she was really fighting for her life and she eventually was overpowering him but she stumbled and fell back and then that's how it ended for her he overpowered her and then that was it she couldn't gain that control back that power back again so after he um gained control over her he left the baton on the floor which is what the walkers had found and he used them the knife and he had it in her back and he walked her back parking lot where the cars were parked so she had actually asked him to go back to get her dog ella so he went back to get the dog and then after that um he had she he had her driving around to all her AT to several ATMs so she could get cash out, but none of the attempts worked. Police believed that she was giving him um, a fake PIN number um, to, buy, to buy time. Gary told police that he kept her alive for three more days, um, promising her that he was finally gonna let her go home before he killed her. He murdered her um, in Dawson's forest. He kept telling her he was gonna let her go home. But he knew deep down that this was a lie. He wasn't gonna let her go. He was gonna kill her because she'd seen his face and she knew all the identifying features of his van. He also knew that the police were everywhere looking for her. So he had to get rid of her quickly because he didn't want to get caught. So he tied her to a tree so she wouldn't escape the whole three days that they was on the mountain because he knew that she could you know she was strong she knew martial arts and then he went looking for something to kill her with and he found a tire jack um and he bludgeoned her with that so he'd made the plea deal with the cops with the law so early 2008 he pled guilty to meredith's murder so just as police were thinking you know we've done it we've got him that's it then um, they started to think you know maybe this might not be his only victim because this is a huge park. Um, so they, you know, their brains were ticking with this. This forest is so big. There's like 600 trail, 600 miles of walking trails. And um, it was this part of the forest that a 80 year old married couple went missing in October of 2007. So they'd been married for 58 years and they loved the outdoors, they loved hiking, they loved nature. So because they lived such a busy life outdoors, it was uh, a few days till anyone had noticed that they had gone missing. You know, when the, their children had not heard from them for a few days, all the neighbours noticed that the newspapers were piling up outside the door. No one was really concerned. So it's, it turned into weeks and then, you know, the children were getting worried. So. Their son Bob reported them missing on November the 7th. So Bob lived in Texas and you know, they live in um, North Carolina. So they exchanged um, communication through email and he just couldn't understand why there had been a lack of communication. Because the couple had so much experience being in the outdoors, 
and they had traveled the forest and the parks they covered the whole area throughout their lives their son wasn't too bothered about them um because he knew that they knew it like the back of their hand so the fact that you know they'd not communicated with him he knew that something bad was going on so the authorities were out looking for the couple Bob was traveling to North Carolina and on the way there he came across the couple's um, SUV. So they find the SUV and authorities are thinking, you know, they've parked the car by the entrance of the National Forest and they've gone for a walk and they've not returned. So they start to pull financial records up and phone records. And um, so at four o'clock um, the afternoon of October 1st, a call was placed from Irene's um, cell phone to 911, but it never got through because the signal was too weak. The bank records show that £300 was withdrew from Irene's account in Ducktown, Tennessee the next day. So that's 25 miles away from where the, the car was parked. But the ATM had security cameras and it shown a skinny figure at the ATM but couldn't he couldn't see that his face properly or her face properly whoever it was um, so they just couldn't work out who this figure was at the ATM but you know um, a week later they were still looking for the couple and they found Irene's body she was covered in leaves and sticks and she'd suffered blunt force trauma to the, the whole of the body her face her head so they're trying to say that even though they found the body in November Irene likely would have died October 21st when she tried to make that 911 call. So, the, her body was found 100 um, metres from her car, but they couldn't find um, John's body. And it wasn't until the next February, four months later, three months later, that a, somebody found his skeletal remains. He was found far away from where his wife's body his wife's body had been found. John hadn't died from blunt force trauma. He had died from a gunshot to the back of the head. So national, local authorities linked up with GBI who found additional um, evidence in Gary's, Gary's van. Authorities started to work together and they came up with a theory that October 21st, um, Gary had been in the forest and he planned to rob um the the elderly couple and they also thought that gary would gary kind of thought he couldn't take on two hostage two hostages at the same time so he killed so he killed irene first so he could then focus his attention on john so gary um had killed irene he was with john he took john he used force um he violence to get his pin number off him and then he got the money out of the ATM so then he got he took um, John in his van back to the forest where he murdered him with a pistol so they tested John's blood with what was found on the DNA in Gary's van and that it was a match so now authorities were worried that they had a serial killer on their hands. So police are worried now that he's injured more people. So they start asking around, you know, law enforcement, um, has anyone come, has anyone um, seen this guy before? Has he been pulled over? Has has he been done for anything else? You know, and, and um, a police officer does come forward and say that he did come across him. Um, it was the year before the murders, um, Gary was trespassing on private hunting ground. So he told the police officer that he was a former paratrooper um, and he was doing some kind of paratrooping work. So the deputy didn't understand what he was on about. So he just said to him, have you got any weapons? And Gary showed him a expandable police baton. So the policeman just decides to let him go. Um, so he lets him go, he checks for any open warrants, there's no open warrants, so he's free to go. But there was actually a warrant out for his arrest and it was from 1972. So the deputy, the police officer said, as he was letting Gary go, Gary's turned round to him and said, I love you. And the deputy just said, oh, you have a nice day. The only thing now police officers needed to nail this case was who was that figure at the ATM, uh, ATM machine? 
so they just look closely at it, did some more investigate investigations and they come to the conclusion that it was Gary, the figure in the raincoat, characteristics were Gary, his height, his weight, blah blah blah. In April 2013, um, a judge sentenced him to life in prison. Again, just like with Meredith, Meredith's case, he took a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. It was just like a, a little niggle what was bothering the police officers because there was a gap between the murders of um, the elderly couple and Meredith and police were just wondering where was he during that time and they actually discovered that. He was in Florida, um, again there's another mountainous forest region where people can camp out, people go for hikes, do exercise and that's what Cheryl Dunlap was doing on December 1st. 2007. She disappeared while she was out on a hike all by herself. So Cheryl was working as a nurse uh, in Dunlop County, I'm guessing in Florida. She had two adult sons. So she was she actually did Sunday school classes and she didn't turn up the next day after her hike. So she'd gone for a hike um, December 1st around that time. Um, next day didn't turn up for Sunday school classes and the the people there were like, this is not like her, this is, you know, so they was, they just had a sinking suspicion, so they just called the cops. They were thinking, you know, maybe she got injured in the park and needed help, but, you know, that illusion was shattered when her car was found with a flat tyre, and there was no sign of Cheryl anywhere near. So December 8th, 180 law enforcement staff went on a search for Cheryl near where her car was found. So obviously they checked her bank records and all that, that kind of stuff and they found again someone was trying to withdraw money from her account on three occasions di on different days. So 13 days went by and there was nothing and then hunters in the wood found Cheryl's decapitated body on December 15th. They couldn't even identify the body because the head was missing so they had to take DNA samples and then it was confirmed that it was Cheryl. One of the hunters came forward and said that December 7th he's seen a homeless looking man um, around the forest with a knife. So police had to, you know, link Gary to Cheryl's murder. So they went back to the hunter and they showed him a picture of Gary and straight away the hunter said, yeah, that was him. That was the man who I seen in the forest. So they got him for Cheryl's murder in the end, it, um, they had the evidence. So Florida was like, no, 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 there's no plea deals and he was sentenced to death. There is actually footage of um, Gary and the police on YouTube somewhere and um, he shows no remorse and he actually says to the police, if he's low on money, food, someone's going to get killed. He's very cavalier about his crimes and he shows no remorse. And there's even points where you can see him laughing about what he did. Um, his, his lawyer, Gary's lawyer, said he was a sociopath, he held nothing back and he would keep carry on, he would have kept, he would have kept, carry on, he would have kept to carry on killing if he wouldn't have been stopped. I also went on to say that he had clinical depression after spending um, two years with Gary and being forced to listen to Gary's crimes. So guys, that is the end of the video, as sad as it was, but you remember to stay safe out there and I'll see you in the next one.